you'd like to, you can be making your way over to Acts chapter 16. We'll be spending almost all of our time here in this chapter this morning, Acts chapter 16. You think about the history of the world, there's been a lot of exciting days. Some of which in a good way, some not. Some of which you would like to have been there, some you're glad you weren't. I think though one of the perhaps most exciting days that one could possibly have witnessed would have been the day of Pentecost when Peter preached that first gospel sermon. And as the crowd heard that sermon, their conviction brought them to realize that they had crucified the Lord and that they needed salvation. And upon asking Peter what to do, Peter said, you need to repent and be baptized, and they did. And so you can imagine Jerusalem, just what it would have been like with thousands of people who would have been lined up at all these different pools and bodies of water, and maybe an apostle standing there as people are coming through and making their confession of Jesus Christ. And so you've got this one day when thousands of people obey. What an exciting day. But yet as the book of Acts continues, Luke takes us from those multitudes being baptized and brings it down to the stories of individuals who were baptized. And I don't know through his inspiration why he chose those specific stories, but yet every one of them is interesting, whether it's the Ethiopian eunuch or whether it's the ones we're going to be talking about today. Very different people, very different walks of life, but yet one thing they have in common is that they all heard the same message and they all did the same thing for salvation. Now one of the beauties of the book is one of those people who was converted was this Jewish rabbi by the name of Saul. He was kind of a hard case. And the Lord had to make His point to Saul, and yet... What did Saul do? Saul believed in the Lord and he was baptized. And the beautiful irony is this one who was kind of a hard case conversion was so converted that the Lord used him to spread the gospel to so many others, just a few of which we're told about. And this morning I want us to talk about two of those. And in between those two conversions, a rather odd event that took place. And so as we find the the pretext of all of this, Paul has received the Macedonian call as it's oftentimes known. He's going into Philippi and there he's going to begin spreading the gospel. So if you look with me here in verse 11 of chapter 16, we find that Paul set sail from Troas, made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and then followed the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony, Luke being with him says, we remained in this city some days. And as was the custom of Paul, when he goes into a city, he'll try to find a place where people are meeting doing religious things. So as he goes into the city, he's here on the Sabbath day, we're specifically told that, And he goes out of the city gates down near the river and he finds a group of women there who are praying. One of these women is specifically named. Her name is Lydia. We're told two things about her. We're told first of all that she was a seller of purple. We know, and you've probably heard this many times before, that this was a rather expensive fabric. And so it shows that she was an entrepreneur. She was likely a woman of means. But yet here she is with these women, which brings the second thing that we're told about of much more importance than that. Not only was she a seller of purple, she's described as a worshiper of God. And so as Luke records this, verse 14, one of those who heard us was a woman named Lydia, who we've introduced, from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, one who is a worshiper of God. And then you'll note what follows that. It says, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. I'd like for you to focus in for just a minute on that term, worshiper of God. We come across that term several times in the New Testament. I want to take you to one, though, where there is a former blind man who's being really grilled over his uh, healing by Jesus 
and the Pharisees are coming down hard on him. And I want you to notice a statement that he makes in the midst of this rather hostile interview. He says to those who are interviewing him, he says, we know that God does not listen to sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does His will, God listens to him. Now this was no theologian. Right? This was not a man who was one of the skilled scholars of the day, at least as far as what we're told. But yet we find that John decided to record his words, and I think for very good reason. Because what he's saying is, is that if you are paying attention to God, God is going to pay attention to you. And I believe the blind man helps us to understand this statement that's made by Luke when he says that the Lord opened Lydia's heart. Over the course of the past 2,000 years, there has been a lot of writing and a lot of discussion on this phrase. And it's taken people in all manner of directions and all manner of thoughts. But simply put this morning, without getting into any of that, one thing we can know for absolute certain, beyond a shadow of a doubt, is it means that God is involved in her conversion. Here is a woman who is a good woman, likely a Jew or perhaps a proselyte, meeting here on the Sabbath day, worshiping with these other women. We might detect from that that there's not enough Jewish men to form a synagogue. We don't know that for sure. But nonetheless, she's with like-minded people. She's a worshiper and she's needing to know more. And God allows that to happen. God allows her heart to be open. But let's make no mistake what was to fill her heart. After we read that in verse 14, it says, The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. When her heart was opened, it was open not to some very, maybe major miraculous event. It was opened so that she would hear the gospel message. The message that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. The message that Ananias spoke to then Saul was the message that Lydia heard on that day. So what happened when Lydia heard that message being spoke? What happened was what Paul told the Romans when he wrote in chapter 10 verse 17 that faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of God. The Lord opened her heart, Lydia heard the gospel message, and very matter-of-factly, Luke tells us about her conversion in almost a passive way. If you look on down to verse 15, it says, and after she was baptized. Perhaps because of the lack of details here, this was an easy conversion. Here was a woman who was already interested in God, a woman who worshipped God, a woman surrounded by godly things, and so when her heart was open and she received that message, she acted on it very quickly. But let's not miss what happened. The same thing that happened on the day of Pentecost, the same thing that happened in the desert with the Ethiopian eunuch, the same thing that happened with Saul when he heard the message of Ananias, she was baptized. That's where the hearing and faith led her. And not only her, but her whole household. We have no idea what age Lydia was. She may have been an older woman with kids gone. She may have been a younger woman with teenagers home. But when you come across the word household, it's not limited to your husband and kids. This would have been servants, perhaps women who were working with her. The entire lot, because of Lydia's example of faith, their hearts were also open. They heard the gospel message and they were baptized. But what kind of woman was Lydia? Well, Luke doesn't really record a lot of details. But he records one thing that shows us what kind of woman that she was. If we continue on in verse 15, it says, She urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And that was not a fake invitation. Because Luke then says, She prevailed upon us. 
Here was a woman who understood what she had received, and here is a woman who understood what it meant to have those who were knowledgeable in the Lord near, and she was wanting more of that. To the point of this very strong term that Luke says, we couldn't get away. This was not an invitation that she really didn't want accepted. She kept on until she got it. And so it appears that they're going to stay around here a few days, going back to the river, to this place of prayer, which is going to lead us to an interlude between what I believe are two very connected accounts. So Lydia has been converted. They're going to the place of prayer, verse 16 tells us. And a very strange event then takes place. Look at verse 16 with me. We were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. So in this pagan city, as Paul is traveling back and forth, probably in teaching sessions, worshiping perhaps as well, there is a possessed servant girl, a girl who has been taken not because of the labor that she performed, but because of the money that she made, for her owners. And she's going to give Paul some trouble, not her in particular, but this spirit that was controlling her. It's interesting that when you look at this, and translations are going to vary just a bit, but if you notice in the ESV where I read, it says the girl had a spirit of divination. Now that's a phrase that we really have not come across in the gospel accounts. Usually it's an unclean spirit or a demon or something of that nature. And if you look at what that term literally means, it's one of those places where you can easily see the English word coming out of it because it's identical. When you read the spirit of divination, what that is is spirit of python. Same word as this big snake that we know about. And so as Luke is writing here, it says she had the spirit of python in her. Now for us, that would be a curious thing, wouldn't it? We'd think, why does she have the spirit of this great big snake in her? If you had been reading this near the city of Philippi, you would have understood exactly what it meant. Because what this is based on is a myth, kind of a, a Greek myth that had to do with the, the place in Delphi where there was an oracle who supposedly could give everyone's future. She was a fortune teller, this witch or this woman who stayed there in Delphi. And I'm not going to get into the whole story here, but this was at the temple of Apollo and has to do with this account supposedly of him killing this big snake and this snake uh, is then going to possess the witch here at Delphi and, and the future is going to be told. You ever wonder why Luke used that term? Why didn't he just stick with an unclean spirit, which it was? Well, let's look at what this myth was. The idea that a serpent dragon was possessing this young girl. We know where we're going, right? Genesis chapter 3 talks about a serpent that was trying its best to thwart the plans of God. And the way the Bible set up, whenever you come across a serpent or a dragon in the Bible, the red flags need to go up. This is something that's taking us back. Now I want you to consider what's going on here. Here within Philippi, which would not have been very far from Delphi, where uh, this, this oracle would have been uh, practicing, there is someone who's trying to stop the work of God. Paul's already had success. The message of salvation has converted Lydia. It's converted those in her household. And one wonders if maybe some of the women by the river, since they keep going to this place of prayer. But nonetheless, the gospel's taking hold in this pagan city. That's bad news. The Lord has, has gone behind enemy lines and He's having success in bringing those who had given themselves to the serpent over to the Lord. And now we've got this unclean spirit, this spirit of Python, 
which I don't think has anything to do with the myth, but rather that play on words to get us to understand that we've got that serpent lurking in Philippi just as we did in the Garden of Eden. And I want you to notice what that evil spirit is saying. So as the girl is following Paul and his company, verse 17 it says that she cried out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. This spirit is using a phrase that was common for evil spirits when they came into contact with Jesus. This is an account over in Mark chapter 5 with a, a spirit that Jesus is getting out of someone and it says the spirit cried out with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Same phrase, same designation for God. Which when you start tracing it back, is a very old expression for God. First time we come across it in the Bible is the book of Genesis with Melchizedek. So we're talking about a phrase to describe God that goes way back in the history of mankind. And here is this spirit of divination, this python spirit, who is going behind this company and telling the exact truth. These men are of the Most High God. They're telling you the way of salvation. Isn't it interesting that this serpent is trying to do what the serpent in the garden did by using the very words of God to try to demote interest in him? I suspect the people of Philippi knew about this little girl and what was going on. And so here she is day after day. She's following Paul. And the, the ESV here translates this, that Paul became greatly annoyed. I, I don't know that that quite gets it. Because when we think about being annoyed, we think about a nuisance or something that maybe isn't detrimental, but just gets on our nerves. You look at it, it's a much stronger idea than that. Uh, going back to a really old word, we could say that Paul was vexed. <laughs> a little different connotation than annoyed. He was deeply grieved because he knew what was going on. He knew that one of the forces of Satan was here very much at work trying to thwart his plan, trying to keep him from preaching the gospel. And so finally, Luke tells us that after several days, Paul cast it out. So here is this spirit... It's cast out of this little girl. And what does that show us? It showed us that Paul could do exactly what our Lord could do. That when there was a force of evil at hand, who had control? The Lord by, by a word could cause that demon to go back to its eternal abode. And Paul is able to do the same thing. So Luke's saying, when you look at Paul, you need to understand he's through and through an apostle of the Lord. He's got this power over evil spirits. But I think there's a second thing that we don't need to miss with this. That in casting it out, he illustrated his refusal to associate with evil. Would it have been somewhat easy for Paul to have turned this to his advantage? Here is this odd little girl. You can just imagine. You know, I, I, I don't know if this was the case, but I wonder if she's the kind of, people that, the kind of person that when she walked by, people would kind of back up from her. Right? You don't want to get too close. This is kind of odd. And maybe Paul could have taken all of this with the circus that surrounded it. And, and turned it, and Paul said, absolutely not. You've got someone evil who's seeking to proclaim the way of God. That is not how this goes. And so he, he demonstrated his power by casting it out. He illustrated his refusal to associate with evil. And also by casting it out, he landed himself in jail. Remember what happened? His, the girl's owners are terribly distraught by this. Their means of livelihood are gone, and so they stir up the crowds and, and get everybody into an uproar, and they're beating Paul and Silas. And finally, they drag them to this jailer and say, lock these men up, put them in there, don't let them out. And so now the Lord has Paul where he needs him because there's another person who needs to be influenced by the gospel. 
And so verse 25 tells us at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and all the prisoners were listening to them. And in this account, kind of linking us back with the Lydia account, we've got another opening that takes place. We find that this time it's not a heart, but rather the doors of this prison. Luke says in verse 26, Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and every bonds, everyone's bonds were unfastened. This was not for Paul's benefit. How do I know that? Because I know that the Lord could get an apostle out of prison much more quietly than this, didn't He? You remember Peter laying there in his cell, and the angel punches him, says, Get up, get your sandals on, let's, let's go. The doors fly open, the, the iron gate flies open, and, and he's out. And here we've got the whole rattling of the prison taking place. No, this was somebody who needed to wake up. And he does. When we go down to verse 27, when the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. He's suicidal. We might could even say he's going to carry out the death penalty on himself, cut out the middleman here because he knows what's going to happen. Paul says, stop. Don't injure yourself. We're all here. Doors are open, bonds are off, but, but we're here. It says that the jailer came to him and kneeling down before him said, what must I do to be saved? Here at this point of near death, trembling, he comes to him and he says, tell me what I need for salvation. And though this jailer was very different from this entrepreneurial, perhaps upper class woman who prayed fervently by the riverside, here is a man, very different situation, but the message is exactly the same. Look at how the apostle answers his salvation question. Verse 31, they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved in all your household. And they spoke the words of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. Same thing. Just as what happened with Lydia, the message of the Lord is spoken and echoing the words of the Gospels that you must believe in the Lord for salvation. That's what the Apostle states. And then we find in verse 33, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he baptized them at once, he and all of his family. Belief and baptism whether you're an Ethiopian eunuch, whether you're a Jewish rabbi, whether you're an entrepreneurial uh, woman by the river, whether you are a jailer, that's how salvation comes. Two openings on either side of dealing with the serpent. And God's illustration that there is no power on earth that can stop a believing heart from being saved. Now, and as we think about these two accounts, I want to bring our lesson to its conclusion by understanding not only are we learning about salvation here, but we're also learning a lot about evangelism. In these two very related accounts here in the city of Philippi, one thing that we're learning is that God opens doors. And so we find that in Lydia, her heart was open. In the story of the jailer, the jail doors were open. And the thing that comes out strongly in both is this, we must never, ever diminish God's role in salvation. Now, why do I say that? That seems like such an obvious point. And yet sometimes when churches begin to feel rather guilty about maybe being a little lackluster in taking the gospel, there's all kinds of innovations and ideas that are developed, but maybe the one thing that ought to be the biggest thing is the least thing, and that's praying to God that He will open doors so that we can find those who need salvation. So let me ask you this, is that a part of your prayer? 
That on a very regular basis you are praying to God that in your daily actions that God will open a door so that you'll have opportunity to spread the gospel. God is involved. And we may not understand how. May not ever know how X and Y and Z all came together to get us to the situation we're at. But it does mean this, that we must be ready to be used. And if I'm praying every day for these doors to be open, I trust God's going to do that. I trust that God's going to use me in bringing the gospel to others. And therefore, if I'm ready for that, I need to be prepared. There's nothing in this account that shows that Paul had any prior knowledge that he was going to run into Lydia or that he was going to face off against the the serpent or that he was going to be speaking to a Philippian jailer, but yet he was able to effectively deal with all because he was prepared. He had the message of God. And we might protest a little and say, but yeah, he was Paul, and yeah, he was Paul. But nonetheless, the message that saved him is the message that saved us. The message that he preached to others is the message you and I need to be preaching to others. And so we need to be ready. We need to be prepared for that. Another lesson that comes across very strongly here is that the point that salvation comes to a lot of people is going to be different. While the message is the same, the situation in life might not be. In the case of Lydia, it seems that what she needed was a completion of her knowledge. She worshipped God. She was meeting with other people to worship God, praying to Him. But yet she needed to know the whole story. And so God is making sure that she has that time And so there's cases for that with us as well, that somebody just may need a little bit more explanation. When those situations come along, we need to be very gentle and humble. It's very easy sometimes to take on a rather arrogant attitude towards someone who maybe doesn't have the same knowledge that we do. And and likely this isn't an overt thing, but even by our demeanor we may give off that particular attitude. We cannot do that. I wonder if we're at a time right now where if we used our opportunities, this may be a time very ripe to bring people to a complete knowledge of God. If you follow religious news at all, there's a lot of seismic shifts going on in the Protestant world in the United States. There are a number of very large, older Protestant denominations that are are breaking asunder right now. They're, They're just coming apart because a number of the social issues are dividing and people who have a good understanding of some things of the Scriptures are seeing that what they're they're being shown and and hear what they're being taught is not by Bible standards and they're, they're hemorrhaging members from their denominations. This may be the very time that we can go to our friends who have maybe a good knowledge of God, but somewhat like Lydia, need to hear the rest of the story and to make that explanation. And so I would encourage all of us to pay attention to that. People we work with, listen to the conversations. Listen to neighbors. If you know of someone who's been in a church that's been dealing with a lot of these things where maybe their leadership is taking a very ungodly path on some of these social issues, strike up a conversation. It just may be that it can be as easy a conversion as it was for Lydia because someone just needed to hear the full story. But there's also going to be times when there are life and death situations that bring someone to see their need. This jailer, before the earthquake, doesn't seem like he's too concerned, right? While Paul and Silas are singing, he's sound asleep, right? They're they're probably getting on his nerves, waking him up every now and again. But yet, when it comes to this point where he's almost at suicide, it's then that he asks his salvation question. Did you notice Paul didn't say, tell you what, I'm glad you asked, but when you're in a better frame of mind, let's let's talk about it. Maybe we can meet tomorrow. (laughs) No. 
He seized that opportunity, didn't He? Because it's at these times that we're often brought to grapple with our mortality. To understand that we are not going to last forever, at least in this life. And that we need to pay attention to what we need to do. And so Paul was ready to speak when the jailer needed to hear. Does it always have to be a life or death situation? It does not, but it may be a life-changing one. Oftentimes, when a couple who's fallen away from the Lord has their first child, that's a good time to bring the gospel message because this is a life-changing event. And they're understanding we're bringing this child into the world and we want this child to have the very best. We look for those opportunities. Maybe it's a time when someone's lost a family member who was very close. We, like Paul, take those. And let me reiterate, we're gentle in that, but we've also got to be a bit bold in that too, don't we? We've got to say, well, I might hurt that person's feelings. They might not like the fact that I'm coming at this time. That didn't seem to bother Paul, did it? And so we look at those opportunities. Perhaps the greatest lesson that stands out in this is that the gospel's for everybody. On the one hand, you've got, again, probably wealthy lady who is an entrepreneur. And on the other hand, a man, if it's like other Roman prison guards, he's a retired soldier, getting on in years, still needs an income. Very different walks of life. But yet that gospel is for everyone. And that's not just for people who look like me. I don't know if your extended family reunions are this way. But almost every extended family reunion, you know, you're calling in uncles and aunts and cousins and second cousins and people that you heard of might be related to you. you got this great big event planned where you're going to get to know each other and everybody divides up into their own little family units. <laughs> Last one I went to exactly that way. You had one uncle and his kids here, another uncle and his kids here, an aunt and her kids here. And though everybody was in the same room, there's just kind of this natural gravitation toward the people with whom you're the most comfortable. That's exactly what we do socially. People who look different than us scare us a little bit. We, we don't know what's going on in their world. And so we, we kind of stand back. Let me tell you something. This nation is looking less and less like this group of people this morning than ever before. And the Lord says, I want you to stop looking at the surface and I want you to go deep and to understand every person, regardless of their color or their race or their gender or how many tattoos and piercings they might have, they're created in my image and I want them with me. I want you to teach them. And so here in Philippi, think about, let's, let's use a, a fancy word that we use, think about the diversity <laughs> in the Philippi church, right? Here you got Lydia with her family. Here you got the jailer with his family. What brought them together? We know what brought them together. Everybody becomes one in Jesus. And so Paul says there's neither Jew or Greek, male or female. There's neither rich or poor. You're all one in Jesus Christ. But before we close, one final lesson. In our zeal to convert, let's remember that God is not going to be unequally yoked with unrighteousness. Now, are we going to have someone with a python spirit chasing around us? I don't think that's going to happen. I, I think we're good there. But sometimes we begin looking to convert in ways that are contrary to the will of God. And so what ends up happening in our zeal to save souls, we begin to minimize the message of salvation. And churches that are zealous and, and wanting to convert will sometimes say, well, the way we're going to get people interested is if, if we have big events that they can bring their kids to and have a good time and, and we can slip a pamphlet to them or we can make these connections. 
Jesus Christ saves. Jesus Christ saves. And if I'm having to use means that are unapproved by Scripture, I'm very much similar to what Paul would have done if he had put up the side show with this girl and said, listen to her, what she's saying about me. No. The only message we need is Jesus Christ. Now on an individual level, maybe there's things we can do to to make ourselves available, but nonetheless, we never ever compromise that message. And I want to encourage all of us to remember that that message that saves souls in Philippi is the same message that will save souls in Madison, Alabama. And we do not have to be apostles of the Lord to take that message because the apostles and the inspired writers have committed that message to Scripture so that we can teach what they taught. And I hope that all of us can understand in these situations it always needs to be that today is the day of salvation. Where someone is, if I have that opportunity, I seize it and I pray for those opportunities that they'll come. And maybe that day is your opportunity not to preach the gospel, but to obey it. That like Lydia, you got some knowledge, but now you got the whole story. And you're ready to believe and be baptized for the salvation of your sins. Or maybe you've gone through a traumatic event in your life and it's, it's kind of rattled you a bit and you realize there are bigger things you need to be concerned about. Today's the day of salvation. So if we can help in that, we certainly stand ready. Or if you're just struggling, while the spirit of Python might not be after you, the devil sure hasn't let up, has he? And maybe he's been pressing hard in your life and you need a prayer for strength or maybe even a prayer for to go with you for forgiveness. We can do that also. Today is a day of salvation. And I hope you'll seize that opportunity. You can come as we stand and sing together.